Welcome to Fair Medicine and the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine's co-sponsored webinar, Understanding Gender Dysphoria, and the latest research with our special guest, psychologist, Dr. Michael Bailey. I'm Dr. Carrie Mendoza, Director of Fair Medicine from the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, a nonpartisan nonprofit dedicated to fostering fairness, understanding, and our common humanity. We're partnering tonight with SEGM, the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine. That's a consortium of researchers, clinicians, physicians, really across, across the globe. And they promote safe, compassionate, ethical, and evidence-based informed healthcare for children, adolescents, and young adults with gender dysphoria. I'd like to thank everyone at FAIR and FAIR Medicine and our friends at SEGM for working so diligently to showcase this important topic about gender dysphoria. Dr. Michael Bailey is here. He's a professor of psychology at Northwestern University since 1989. And although most of his research has concerned sexual orientation, in recent years, he's increasingly studied gender dysphoria and transgender gender identity issues. Dr. Bailey recently published the journal article, Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria, Parent Reports on 1,655 Possible Cases, adding to the body of knowledge about gender dysphoria in adolescents and young adults. His paper sparked an all too familiar effort to deplatform the study and to fire the editor, Dr. Ken Zucker from the scientific journal that published it. Fair brought this issue to the public's attention through an open letter, which I hope you all have seen and, and signed, which has garnered over 1,900 signatures uh, just in, a, in about a week, including some uh, who signed just as concerned parents, as well as just some very noted public intellectuals and physicians. So we hope you all will take a look at that if you haven't. So we'll hear directly tonight from Dr. Bailey about gender dysphoria in youth and why this topic is so difficult to study and debate and why we need more of both. Before we get started, just some housekeeping. Um, we know folks are gonna have a lot of questions, so use the Q&A function and please write your questions in there. We are so grateful tonight to have um, our co-host from SEGM, some of the great researchers helping to answer those questions. So please do take the opportunity to engage there as well. So without further ado, I will pass it over to uh, Dr. Michael Bailey, who will uh, be doing a presentation for us. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for asking me to uh, speak to this group and for those of you who are uh, here. Uh, so this is uh, a very general title that'll be a little more specific than that. I'll get to it momentarily. Uh, first, let's uh, have some introductions. Uh, so I know more about me than I know about you. <laughs> this is uh, who I think you are. Uh, and uh, this is who I am. Uh, there's a lot of overlap there. Uh, especially we share uh, an interest in open inquiry, academic freedom, and uh, free speech. Um, one more thing before I get into uh, the content tonight. Uh, thank you so much for what you've done so far. Uh, unless you have been in the middle of something like this, and it's not my first rodeo, you can't know how uh, important it is to have the support that you've shown to me and to Ken Zucker, who is uh, both my friend and my respected colleague. So some reasons why you should care about what I say. Uh, I've been studying this stuff for 30 years, including transgender phenomena. Back in the day, we called it transsexualism. Um, I am scientifically disagreeable. It may not sound good to you, but it's actually a good uh, trait for a scientist. What it means is that I am uh, willing to disagree 
with anybody and everybody on a scientific basis. If I uh, believe that I know <laughs> that an idea that somebody has said is incorrect, I will say it. Uh, and that doesn't mean that I don't like this person. It just means that I disagree. Uh, and I hope that you will keep that in mind uh, if we disagree tonight on anything. Uh, finally, I have knowledgeable, very knowledgeable friends, colleagues, and collaborators, including these three people the, from the left to the right. That's Ken Zucker, that's Ray Blanchard, and that's Lisa Littman. Uh, these are the three most knowledgeable people in the world, most important people on the main phenomena that I'll be talking about in a moment. Uh, a little um, context, uh, times have changed a great deal since I started studying this stuff in the mid nineties. Uh, and especially I would say before 2000, the year 2000, it was a very much different time than after say 2015 and especially since 2020. But we noticed some big changes uh, starting in 2015. Uh, the first change is that um, the transgender phenomena that we studied and thought about changed from primarily adults uh, to kids and especially uh, adolescents and especially adolescent girls. Uh, to be sure, uh, children have always been studied, especially by Ken Zucker uh, and people like him, and I'll be talking about that. Uh, but the big change is in adolescence. Uh, parents have changed. Parents used to really be concerned to avoid uh, any kind of transgender transition, transsexual outcomes for their children's for their children, and now parents uh, often actively cooperate in transitioning their children. Words and definitions have changed, seems like they change weekly. Uh, transsexualism is no longer a popular word. Some people take offense. Uh, another thing about being scientifically disagreeable, I don't really care about offending people. I use words uh, that uh, have been used for a long time. Uh, and a lot of the word changes and proposed definitions uh, are poorly thought out uh, and not very useful. Uh, and that makes it hard to estimate prevalences. We all have the uh, impression that uh, more and more people are becoming transgender, more and more people are transitioning. And I think uh, there's some truth to that, but it's really hard to know. And especially because in the United States, people uh, keep such poor data on things. Experts have changed. Uh, back in my day, experts were academics who published groundbreaking research, who knew the most. Uh, these are uh, the new experts, at least some of them. Uh, these are experts who I consider activists. They are all about transitioning children and adolescents. And none of them, uh, I believe, is a very good scientist. So I'll be talking today about three kinds of gender dysphoria. And the reason why I'm talking about this is that uh, people interested in this general domain uh, need to know about these different kinds of gender dysphoria. People um, speak too generally, uh, and these three kinds of gender dysphoria have different causes. They have different presentations. They likely have different optimal treatments and outcomes. Uh, so without further ado, uh, this is um, an essay, a blog that I wrote for uh, the excellent uh, blog site, Fourth Wave Now, and uh, it was published in December, 2017. Wrote it with Ray Blanchard. Gender dysphoria is not one thing. Uh, a lot of this that I'll be talking about tonight hasn't changed from them. 
from then. A, a, a little of it has, uh, but uh, I recommend uh, this essay still. Okay, so the three types of gender dysphoria I'll be reviewing tonight are childhood onset gender dysphoria, autogynephilic gender dysphoria, and rapid onset gender dysphoria. Childhood on, onset gender dys dysphoria occurs in both boys and girls. The onset is before puberty uh, and it has obvious signs. So we have pictures of uh, on the left, uh, a uh, child, childhood onset gender dysphoric boy on the right, uh, that's a girl. Uh, the girl is, uh, I think, now transitioned. I don't know about the boy. Um, this can onset uh, even before age one, at least the extreme childhood gender nonconformity. Of course, gender dysphoria means unhappiness with one's uh, uh, sex at birth. Uh, and Gender nonconformity can exist without gender dysphoria. So in the old days, uh, parents discouraged persistence, meaning that they wanted their kids to grow out of it as soon as possible. And perhaps relatedly, there were high desistance rates of this uh, condition by early adolescence. Most gender dysphoric children grew out of it. They became children who no longer wanted to change sex. However, if they didn't grow out of it by mid-adolescence, persistence was pretty common. And then they were likely to medically transition, including hormones and surgery. But medical transition back in the old days, <laughs> before 2000, certainly, uh, medical transition occurred during young adulthood after sexual maturation. And sexual maturation sometimes uh, brought things like masculinization of the face, which, um, you know, uh, male to female transsexuals didn't like that much. Um, they, they would have liked to have avoided that. Uh, back in the old days, uh, there was very low regrets rate. Regrets rate. Most uh, transitioners seem to be happy with the uh, results, at least happier with their new lives than with their old life. Uh, and childhood onset gender dysphoria is strongly associated with same-sex attraction in adulthood, whether uh, these individuals transition or not. Uh, the large majority of the uh, natal males, the boys, become adults attracted to men. And uh, even though fewer of the girls grew up to be female attracted, still they were uh, much more likely to be uh, female attracted than somebody without that condition would be. So nowadays, uh, many parents are encouraging these uh, children to uh, be their true selves, to transition, to social transition at early ages, which means that they would essentially, like a little uh, boy with child onset gender dysphoria, they would let him uh, essentially be, live as a girl, go to school as a girl, and so on. Um, medically, uh, this type is the type most associated with hormone blockers uh, at the beginning of puberty to prevent, um, for males, uh, masculinization of the face and so on, for females to prevent uh, breast growth and so on. And then uh, during adolescence, if the uh, children want to go forward, there'd be cross-sex hormones, which uh, they will take for life as long as they stay transitioned. And also uh, gender-affirming surgery uh, is desired as soon as possible, which is often uh, at the age of 18. 
this is uh, one of the most famous uh, child on onset cases. Uh, this is uh, Jazz Jennings. Uh, so from left to right, that's uh, Jazz as a little boy uh, in the middle, Jazz as a little boy. And then uh, on the right, that's Jazz Jennings as an adolescent uh, trans girl. Uh, her parents uh, let Jazz uh, socially transition. Uh, they let her receive uh, uh, puberty blockers at age 11. Uh, they also uh, run a reality TV show that I think is still going on. Uh, Jazz seemed to be, at least on the uh, early version of the uh, reality TV show, a very happy young individual. Uh, this is Jazz recently. Um, Jazz has uh, developed some problems. She's uh, developed a binge eating problem. I don't know to what extent that has anything to do with her treatment. She also had uh, major surgical complications. She seems to be emotionally unhappy. Uh, she's depressed a lot. Um, so deciding what is best for these children, like jazz, uh, I, I don't think jazz is likely to change her mind and say, I am I made a mistake. I want to go back and be a, a man now, it would be. Uh, there, jazz will not be a regretter. But does that mean that we did the best we could for jazz? I'm less sure for that. I think the best way to think about outcome is uh, comparing what happened to the counterfactual. How would jazz be today if she'd been encouraged to stay male? Uh, I think it's uh, very plausible that she would be at least as happy as she is. And she certainly wouldn't uh, be on the hook for all the medical um, uh, complications and treatments she's going to have to have for the rest of her life. Uh, Ken Zucker, the editor uh, who has been uh, attacked for publishing a recent article, uh, this is not his first rodeo either. Uh, Ken Zucker started uh, a very famous and influential and important clinic uh, for uh, gender dysphoric children in uh, uh, at, at the uh, uh, then Clark in Institute of Psychiatry. Um, and uh, he was uh, dismissed from the clinic he helped start uh, and uh, I think it was 2016. Why? Well, um, no good reason. I, I think really because he did not unambivalently support transition. It's not that he never supported transition for any child. If, uh, if a child he saw in therapy uh, persisted uh, past a certain point, he certainly uh, was on board uh, raising that with the uh, child and the family, that perhaps it was time. Uh, I should say also that uh, Ken Zucker won a substantial uh, uh, legal settlement later. Uh, he was fired for bad reasons. The second type that I'll talk about is autogynephilic gender dysphoria. This will be less familiar with most of you. Uh, first, we have to say what autogynephilia is. Autogynephilia is a natal male's sexual arousal by the fantasy of being or the act of imitating a woman. I currently think of autogynephilia as an internalized sexual attraction. Works like this. Heterosexual men are sexually attracted to women in the real world. And an autogynephilic male creates a woman within inside himself. And that is 
his primary sexual target. Autogynophilia is a paraphilia, which is an atypical sexual interest that is uh, uh, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, of the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, I also think it can be thought of as a rarish sexual orientation. One study, uh, which I've always thought uh, came up with too high a number, but uh, it's it's the best study we have. It estimated uh, the rate of autogynephilia uh, as about 3%. And uh, autogynephilia is not, it's definitely not narcissism, even though that is a common inference. Narcissism is uh, undue high self-regard. Autogynephilia is a natal male sexual arousal by the fantasy of being a woman. Those are different things. So who is autogynephilic? Well, all these groups, um, I believe based on what I know uh, and the best current theory are presumptively autogynophilic. I'm, I am as sure as I can be, although again, I have as a scientist, I have to be open-minded to being shown to be wrong. But uh, heterosexual male cross-dressers who uh, used to be called transvestites, uh, transgender natal males, who are not exclusively male attracted. Any transgender natal male who says, for example, that they're bisexual, to me, that puts them in the probably autogynophilic camp. Uh, transgender natal males who've been heterosexually married uh, and controversial, controversially, but I, I believe this, we can talk about it. We can disagree together later. I think many or most natal males uh, thought to have rapid onset gender dysphoria are probably autogynephilic. So uh, transvestic fetishism, these are some examples uh, that are uh, kind of classic. These are some famous heterosexual transsexuals, uh, none of whom, uh, to my knowledge, has ever come out and used the word autogynephilia about themselves. And yet, uh, I think that's uh, the best way to understand them. Uh, that is my bet. And then some new kinds of faces. Um, the person on your left uh, is one of my Twitter followers who I asked for uh, uh, pictures of some young autogynephilic uh, uh, individuals. And she uh, gave me both of these, both have uh, both permitted these to be shown. And uh, they both started uh, transition pretty young uh, before uh, they reached adulthood. Both have been on hormones. Both identify themselves as autogynephilic. They know about autogynephilia and they understand themselves that way. Uh, the end of my Twitter follower on the left is a very smart young person. Uh, I, I, I find her delightful and I will use uh, female pronouns. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you know, I think she may well go to graduate school to study this kind of stuff someday. So autogynephilic gender dysphoria, to have that, you gotta have autogynephilia. Uh, this only occurs in males. Uh, the onset of autogynephilia happens in early adolescence, same as the uh, onset of all male sexual feelings. All male sexual interests are evident in early adolescence. That's when uh, gay men, most of them first know that they're gay. Most heterosexual men don't even have to think about being heterosexual, but that's when they start 
having intense sexual arousal and feelings. Autogynephilia is not at all obvious to parents. I don't know of an autogynephilic individual who's ever told his parents, hey, mom, I'm really having these strong sexual fantasies about having breasts in a vulva. I really, it really turns me on uh, when I sneak your panties into the bathroom and try them on, which is uh, probably the most common early manifestation of autogynephilia. Sometimes autogynephilia does not lead to gender dysphoria. Some autogynephilic individuals are content uh, to lead their whole lives, uh, just as occasional cross-dressers, for example. Um, although these sometimes struggle with shame, being cross-dressers. The onset of autogynephilic gender dysphoria per se can be much later. Often, for example, after somebody has married and had children. Uh, Caitlyn Jenner uh, had several children by different wives. That is a kind of outcome that I think is unfortunate, and it's analogous to what used to happen uh, for gay men back when uh, there was tremendous societal stigma for homosexuality. You would have a lot of closeted gay men, gay men in denial, for example, who would uh, get married, have children, uh, and that often did not work for them forever. So what causes autogynephilia? Something that uh, is very commonly mentioned these days, and I so common I wanted to address it, is the phenomenon of sissy hypnoporn. Sissy hypnoporn, uh, I've actually never watched it, but um, it's uh, an unusual kind of pornography in which, um, uh, well, let me show you the old version. Uh, this is from before the internet, but has the same themes, uh, which include cross-dressing, being forced to cross-dress, and often being forced to sexually interact with men. Those all are strong sexual interests among many autogynephilic males, including having sex with men. It is not because autogynephilic males are sexually attracted to men, rather the act of having sex with a man and being desired by a man makes them feel like a woman and that's arousing to them. I think that pornography does not cause male sexuality, including autogynephilia. I don't think uh, sissy hypno porn causes autogynephilia. Rather, pornography reveals male sexuality. And I think that's part of why so many people uh, hate pornography. It's not like I especially like it, <laughs> but I, I think that uh, male sexuality is often not very attractive. Uh, so I don't think, again, that pornography of any kind causes autogynephilia. What does cause it, we don't know. What would be best for autogynephilic persons? Uh, first and foremost, knowledge about autogynephilia. Uh, I had many, I have had many emails from people who have read my book, which addresses uh, autogynephilia, among other things, thanking me for, because they had never understood themselves before. And I think that uh, they will make better life decisions if they know about autogynephilia. And the question mark uh, is there because I don't know what the best outcome 
for autogynephilic individuals is, and it may differ by the individual. Some <laughs> might be best to try to resist acting on autogynephilic fantasies. Stop with the cross-dressing. Some may even benefit from um, biological treatment to suppress their sex drives. Some may benefit from transitioning. We don't know what would be best because research into finding this out has been suppressed. I know this personally. This is a book that I wrote that was published in 2003, The Man Who Would Be Queen. Uh, there were three sections of the book. The first uh, talked about child onset gender dysphoria. The, the second talked about male homosexuality and the way that gay men uh, have both masculine and feminine traits. And the third section was on transsexuals. Um, my cancellation was entirely due to um, the part of the third section that addressed autogynephilia. This individual st started the campaign against me. Lynn Conway uh, is a very eminent computer scientist uh, who was at the University of Michigan. Uh, if you uh, find her site, you will see many, many, many web pages about what an evil person I am and how wrong I am. This is Andrea James, uh, who uh, was Conway's henchman. Oh, his henchman misgendering Andrea James? I'm sorry, let me just say, uh, this is Lynn Conway's creep. Uh, on the uh, right uh, is something that she posted in 2003. Those are pictures of my children that I had on my webpage, and you can read what she put underneath them. And uh, I'm not showing you this to get your sympathy. I'm okay. My kids are okay. My kids were strong. Uh, I was proud of them for how they got through that. Rather, I'm showing you what these people can be like, especially Andrea James, who continues to creep people out, including uh, gender therapists, well-known gender therapists and researchers. These are the most important victims of my autogynephilic cancellation, the young individuals with autogynephilia, because we can't advise them about consequences of decisions that they want to make. Here are a couple of reasons of hope for these individuals on the left. Uh, Kevin Zhu is my ex uh graduate student. He's now an assistant professor at Penn State Abington, and he has started a long-term survey of males with autogynephilia. He's going to follow them up, see how they turn out. Hopefully, we'll get some um, good information about uh, how they can be happy, the best ways they can be happy. And on the right is a book by another of my Twitter followers, Phil Illy, who's autogynephilic, uh, and he has written this book, which will be published, I think, in June. And I have read it. It's excellent. Uh, if anybody wants to find out about that, and you don't have to be autogynephilic to uh, get something out of that. <clears throat> uh, I'm not autogynephilic, and I found it very useful. You will, if you want to be a, uh, get some interesting scientific ideas, read that book. Okay, here's the third and final type that we'll be discussing, rapid onset gender dysphoria. <clears throat> rapid onset does not mean the rapid increase in both of these graphs and the number of cases from about 2010 to about 2018-19, uh, but that is a shocking increase in cases. On the right, you can see uh, that the red line is especially upward uh, going, and that that's girls, 
females. The the uh, blue one is males. And I should say, uh, oh, never mind. Okay, so rapid onset gender dysphoria happens in uh, uh, adolescents or young adults who did not previously have any indication of having trouble with their gender. It's characterized typically by sudden announcement of transgender thoughts or status. I am trans. What? Just last year, you liked wearing dresses. You had a boyfriend. You seemed happy. No, I'm trans. This is uh, more common in natal females with pre-existing emotional issues. Uh, and there is evidence of social con influence or contagion. <clears throat> this is my favorite person who used to have rapid onset gender dysphoria. This is Helena Kirshner. Uh, in the red rectangle, that's pre-gender dysphoria. She looks like a pretty feminine uh, girl with a pink phone, and she was, uh, by her own account, <laughs> not a masculine girl. Uh, and down in the blue rectangle, that's her after she detransitioned, after she quit being gender dysphoric. And in the middle, that's her trans phase. Uh, Helena is a brilliant young woman and one of the most informed people I've ever talked to about gender dysphoria, especially rapid onset gender dysphoria. I strongly recommend her, if you have any reason uh, to uh, seek a speaker or an expert on this phenomenon. And she is doing great. So social contagion in girls and women, you know, uh, just why? Well, I'm not sure I know why, but I just want to remind you, there's a history. So uh, that, that's some uh, witch accusers in Salem, Massachusetts in 1692. This is Charcot in Paris. Uh, hypnotizing a hysteric, who they were all women, in 1887. Uh, the woman on the left uh, in 1986 was hospitalized uh, and eventually became came to believe that she had over 100 different personalities. She was had multiple personality, uh, and she later successfully sued the psychiatrist. Bennett Braun for uh, several million dollars. Uh, on the right, uh, that is a woman who um, helped send her father to prison on the basis of recovered memories that her father had murdered her childhood friend. Her father uh, successfully appealed the accusation. So on the left, we're talking about multiple personality disorder. On the right, we're talking about recovered memories of sexual abuse. Those uh, social contagious epidemics happened in the mid 80s to the mid 90s, and they were related to each other. And more recently, um, uh, these are some other examples of social contagion uh, that uh, uh, disproportionately affect females. Tumblr uh, is uh, an important vehicle. So uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria, uh, the first uh, article ever was this one, uh, published by uh, Lisa Littman. And uh, upon publication of this article, the scientific community and uh, the therapeutic communities immediately accepted the conclusions and uh, all agreed that rapid onset gender dysphoria was a legitimate concept. No, that didn't happen. Uh, Lisa Lipman's um, paper was attacked. Uh, she had to make 
revisions that were entirely unnecessary. There was nothing wrong in the first version. Uh, Brown University, where she worked, stopped um, their affiliation with her. Uh, and um, uh, that has not stopped Lisa Lippman from remaining uh, the most important scientist studying rapid onset gender dysphoria and inspiration to the rest of us. This is the paper uh, that uh, we recently published, Susanna Diaz and myself, and I'll tell you a little bit about it in a moment. Uh, so Susanna Diaz uh, is the mother of a child uh, with rapid onset gender dysphoria. Susanna Diaz is not her real name. I first met her in 2018 at a small conference where she presented the results of a survey that she had started. And I was impressed and recommended that she uh, publish uh, this in an academic journal. Uh, and eventually uh, we collaborated and our paper uh, came out. <clears throat> the parents were recruited from uh, this website, parentsofrogdkids.com. And uh, it reported on 1,655 children between the ages of 11 and 21, at least that's when their gender dysphoria began, whose parents believed they had ROGD. 75% uh, of the ROGD youth were female. Uh, there was a high rate of pre-existing emotional problems. Uh, parents uh, in, reported on formal diagnoses, for example. Many of, uh, almost half of these uh, kids had it, most commonly depression and anxiety. And the problems preceded gender dysphoria by about four years. There was a high rate of social transition, especially among the females, much less so among the males. Hormonal transition was much rarer and surgical transition rarer still, uh, which I think is good. Uh, parents said that after social transition, uh, the, uh, their children got much worse off, much more unhappy, et cetera. Who did transition? Not everybody transitioned. Well, the ones who were most likely transition were the youth with more problems. Also, the youth whose family had consulted a gender therapist. And furthermore, the uh, parents who had consulted a gender therapist said that they felt pressure to transition their child. Uh, in the month after we published the paper, there were concerns, surprise, surprise, by activists. Uh, and then uh, the International Academy of Sex Research, where I used to be a proud member, but it has become increasingly uh, less scholarly and more oriented to identity politics. Uh, the uh, uh, leadership, the current leadership put out a statement saying that they had concerns about the ethics and the method of the paper. And this has prompted Springer Nature, who's the publisher of the journal Archives of Sexual Behavior, to launch an investigation. Uh, perhaps they are doing their due diligence. I hope that's all it is. Uh, I will be very disappointed if anything serious happens to our paper, like retraction, or even more so to the editor, Ken Zucker. Um, so the current status of ROGD, uh, I, I think there's substantial reason to believe the ROGD hypothesis. I've seen no evidence really that I believe against it. However, admittedly, the research base is sparse. There's only been uh, the two main papers, Lisa's and ours, uh, empirical uh, addressing it, 
There have been some others, like uh, Lisa's published a study of detransitioners, but that wasn't focused on ROGD. Uh, as they say, you know, you have to say this almost in every paper, uh, more research is needed, but this is really, really true and urgently. We need more research in this area. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, an organization that Lisa Littman has started uh, to facilitate more research. And I would encourage you to visit this website to find out what we're up to. This is uh, a study that Lisa Lippmann, Ken Zucker, and I are about to launch. We hope to have this launched, I would say, midsummer. We have been planning a long term follow up study of children and their families, uh, where the children are adolescents and young adults with gender dysphoria. How you can help uh, keep doing what you're doing, uh, supporting us and our academic freedom. Thank you again. Uh, encourage good research on these topics. Uh, lobby for public funding. The chance that we will get a federal grant for this currently is zero. And I hate applying for grants so much, even when I have a chance, uh, it, it, it'll be a waste of my time. Uh, but it is possible sometimes to lobby the government for uh, a change in funding uh, priorities. And we would like to go up in the priority, try to influence private foundations, and importantly, demand follow-up data from Clinicians who are transitioning these adolescents, we need follow-up data. I'll end with uh, this profound quote from my favorite um, philosopher, Emil Faber, knowledge is good. Um, that is from the movie Animal House, by the way. And when I saw that uh, in, uh, gosh, I don't know, in the late 70s, my friends and I thought that it was really hilarious that a college had that as a motto, knowledge is good. Increasingly though, uh, and uh, sadly and scarily, not everybody gets the joke. I'm done, thank you. Oh, gotta unmute myself. So, wow, that was, fantastic and at FAIR and at SEGM, we, we love uh, more knowledge and research. And we are, we again, are so grateful that you came um, to speak with us. Um, our membership at FAIR, we have a lot of parents across the country who are really, really concerned. And again, I'm so thankful uh, for your work and coming. Now, we have got over 60 questions and we're, we're not going to be able to get to them all, um, but I do have uh, my helpers at Segum. Um, so I'm going to go through a few things here. So um, can you comment on why parents are now supporting transition in younger children? Is it emotional pressure from providers and clinics, misinformation from clinics, bias in the general media, or all of the above? And feel free to add more in there. Um, so I, I think part of it is um, good intentions gone awry. Uh, and if, if you can think about how rapidly some things have changed in a good way, uh, at least in my opinion, um, Tolerance of uh, gay rights, for example, when I uh, first started teaching at Northwestern in 1989, uh, gay rights were quite controversial. Uh, I got a lot of hate mail for uh, conducting studies uh, showing, you know, studies of genetics of uh, sexual orientation. And people thought that I was trying to, I don't know excuse homosexuality or something like that. Um, and now we have uh, gay marriage. Um, and, 
you know, I, I think a lot of parents uh, went a long way. Uh, they they accept their gay kids, but there's th been this overgeneralization that um, trans is just the same as homosexuality, and it's not. Uh, you know, I'm a, an expert on sexual orientation. That's my primary uh, uh, area, and I say confidently, as confidently as I can, you can't change sexual orientation male sexual orientation doesn't even change it 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 just doesn't change it's even if it's a sexual orientation we wish would however gender dysphoria changes especially childhood gender dys dysphoria and i suspect especially rapid onset gender dysphoria Less sure about autogynephilic gender dysphoria. So I, I think th that's my best, and it's very unsatisfying partial answer. I, I, I remember the first mother that I <clears throat> ever met, and it was probably in, I don't know, 2008 or something, where she proudly told me that she was going to let her little boy become a girl. And I was very surprised. And I, you know, I said, you know, the research says that he'll probably grow up and be a happy gay man. I said, I know. Uh, it's also become cool to be trans and to be a parent who is cool with being trans mm -hmm. it, it you know it, it had the media is all about that um so i will stop and mm -hmm. uh take another question yeah yeah it, it it's complicated the only other thing i'll add from practicing medicine um is that you know the the Obviously, the issues with the mental health crisis are huge, but I've seen the different solutions that have been sort of grasped onto. And, you know, in the lead up to the opioid crisis, part of it was that, oh, if you prescribe these opioids, people will be less depressed and anxious and et cetera. So it kind of got mushed in with a lot of other things, too. So I always think there's, you know, some some similarities there, too. So. Um, OK, next question. How can you determine the regret rate if they're is a lack of long-term follow-up. That's kind of a softball one. <laughs> yeah, so the, remember I talked about the old days. The old days, there were responsible researchers and clinicians who did long-term follow-up, especially uh, the Clark Institute of Psychiatry. Ray Blanchard uh, uh, did follow-ups of uh, transsexual uh, transsexuals who'd had surgery. And uh, he found that um, there was little regret among female to male and among the, um, what he called the homosexual male to female transsexuals. Well, those were the child onset, but they were not transitioned until adulthood. Uh, and usually, you know, well into their 20s. Uh, there was a little higher regret rate among the autogynephilic uh, transsexuals, but um, it wasn't that high. Now, all bets are off because times have changed so much. We, I, I am really not confident at all uh, that the, re the regret rates would stay the same. And, and the, the pro-transition clinicians are using the old rates and saying, you know, it's going to be okay. They're they're really low regrets. Yeah, that's you make excellent points. And again, back to just really needing needing uh, to really have proper research structure with follow up um, and and tracking. And and that is that is so that is so lacking. So um, let's see here. I. Another question. I know that earlier data on young males with gender dysphoria were largely homosexual as adults, but this does this apply to the current cohort? Is there, 
data on this for the vast majority of parents of boys. I know their kids are homosexual. Most are on the autism spectrum or have uh, those traits. They also do not necessarily fit the agonophilia profile. They just don't want to be male or deal with their male anatomy and sex drive. So a little, I you know, think a little more detail around that. What's going on with boys, which is the okay. boy crisis. Yeah. So love to hear your yeah. thoughts there. Yeah. So I had been thinking that the child onset cases like Jazz would just turn out the same. Recently, however, Jazz Jennings said evidently that she is primarily attracted to girls. And if she's telling the truth and she's in, insightful, it could be that the treatment that Jazz received, those blockers, changed her brain <laughs> and made her development different than it used to be. So now the, uh, the adolescent, onset cases um this so this i'm sorry i'm going to be disagreeable here uh i am open-minded that something like rapid onset gender dysphoria is happening in uh males as well as females but it is very difficult to exclude the possibility that many or most of these cases are autogynophilic. You as their parents are not going to know <laughs> unless, mm -hmm. you know, unless you, your uh, son is unusually disclosing or unless you have cameras everywhere. Um, I have um, done a very scientific Twitter poll <laughs> asking my uh, autogynophilic followers, you know, whether their families knew uh, when they were adolescents and almost all of them said no. Uh, I have a good friend who is a, uh, a therapist uh, who uh, has seen autogynophilic male clients, some of whose uh, parents think that they have ROGD. Uh, the an autistic presentation uh, is uh, not uncommon for uh, males with autogynophilia. Although I I will say this uh, autogynophilia, in my uh, opinion, is uh, an overrated and unhelpful concept. It is overdiagnosed. I don't even really know what it means anymore, other than maybe socially awkward. Uh, so I'll stop. Okay. Why, why, why you, you made a comment that it's, it's doesn't exist for girls. Why is that autogynophilia? Um, but like the reverse isn't true. Yeah. Just yeah. So since we're on the, autogynophilia, the, yeah. Yeah, the, the, there is, there is, um, a proposal that some that the female analog exists, it would be called autoandrophilia, which is would be a female sexual arousal by the idea of being male. Uh, I am skeptical, uh, though open minded. Uh, my uh, Phil Illy, the guy whose book uh, that I showed, he believes in this. He argues about it in his book, but I don't think that the evidence is there. Female and male sexuality are fundamentally different. We've studied this a lot in, in our lab. Men have something, men have a very directed and strong sex drive to, toward a type of person, or sometimes could be other than a person. Sometimes it could be interdirected, but it's fixed. Females don't tend to have as fixed a sexual orientation. And Probably as a result of that, paraphilias, which are, are almost exclusively found in males. And autogynophilia is a paraphilia. Uh, so I don't think the female version exists. Uh, but, you know, I, I will be studying it. It's one of the things I, on my uh, agenda. Awesome. Okay. 
going in a little different direction, to what extent are parents of children with ROGD responsible for progression uh, of dysphoria? Does Munchausen's by proxy play a role? And maybe you want to just say what Munchausen's by proxy is for those who might not know. Uh, I think, well, Munchausen's by proxy, I think some people might also uh, used to describe Jazz Jennings' parents, I, or I mean, I, I think the idea is that parents are um, creating a disorder in their children, or encouraging it for their own sake, uh, and so I, I'm not a I'm not a therapist, uh, and I. I don't see um, uh, ROGD cases, and uh, you know, I, I've I've done research where I've uh, definitely studied uh, the old type of transsexuals, including autogynephilic transsexuals. I know some, and so on. But uh, ROGD uh, clinically, I, I know less well. I I, I guess. Knowing uh, Susanna Diaz, who is just a very admirable person, uh, I'm very hesitant to say that I, I can't imagine that she would have done anything to help cause ROGD and her child. Uh, but it could happen. And, you know, I, I would say, you know, ROGD, if uh, some parents whose children have ROGD, they go with it. They help these children transition. And I think that is, I think that's a bad idea. Uh, and I think it's likely to lead to problems. That said, do I know how to make it go away? I do not. I, uh, yeah, you know, it, it right, it's complicated. Could there be some, you know, one child and by proxy? I mean, I, I've seen things unrelated to this topic, but, you know, over the years, Munchausen's, but it, I mean, this is, this whole thing is very, very complicated, like we were, we were saying before with social media, social contagion, and a whole host of other things. So again, really good that you're researching it. Um, someone asked, we were talking about porn. Thank you. Does the misogynistic portrayal of women in porn contribute to the high rate of ROGD in girls? So sort of a little bit of another thought around, around that, that sort of like, it seems so scary out there, all these things coming at, you know, so different than the way, than the way we grew up. So I, I could see how that would be very overwhelming. I'm just wondering if you, you know, have looked into that and you know, what, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, I don't think that porn has gotten more misogynistic than it used to be. I don't think that men have gotten more misogynistic than they used to be. Uh, I, I have heard that hypothesis. It doesn't seem all that plausible to me uh, that, that girls are so horrified by male sexuality that they uh, become gender dysphoric. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's plausible, but I don't know. You know, uh, the, whoever uh, offered that question, uh, you know, help me think of a way to uh, do research on that question and we'll see what we can do. Okay, um, here's a question. Uh, Dr. Bailey said that they did not, uh, if uh, a child did not grow out grow out of this by adolescence, they would persist at a high rate. Uh, but has this been studied uh, systematically from quote unquote, before puberty blockers were so actively used? For example, an er early Dutch study of quote unquote rejects from transition in adolescence showed 80% actually desisted as mature adults, even though they were dysphoric in adolescence. How certain are we in this narrative? The fact that, quote unquote, once dysphoric in adolescence, they will persist, unquote, has been weaponized to transition ROGD youth. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let me clear, yep. that question uh, is confusing 
two things, and it's important to distinguish okay. them. Uh, what I said uh, regarding uh, persistence into well into adolescence, implying that transition is likely, refers only to the first type of gender dysphoria, where the onset is before puberty, typically well before puberty. You would be seeing obvious signs of a little boy being extremely feminine and wanting to be a girl or a little girl being extremely masculine and wanting to be a boy. Those are the type that if it if they don't grow out of it by the age of 14, 15, then, you know, I'm thinking they're not going to grow out of it. That has nothing to do with ROGD. ROGD is, ROGD occurs typically in an adolescent or a young adult who was never gender, gender dysphoric before yesterday. <laughs> you know, the parents never thought of them as being gender troubled. Now, that doesn't mean that they, for example, that a girl wasn't a little tomboyish. It doesn't mean that a girl isn't a lesbian. You know, but you can be a tomboy, you can be a lesbian without having been gender dysphoric. Yeah, right. Really, really important. Um, and your like three buckets really help, I think, clarify and understand that very important point. Um, someone wrote comment on how cross sex hormones actually do change sexual orientation for many. What's the mechanism? So I, I think that might be potentially two questions in there. Does it change the sexual orientation for many? And I guess what's the mechanism? <laughs> or I'm adding and making it a two question. <laughs> so cross-sex hormones uh, are not going to change male sexual orientation. Uh, you know, back in the day, sometimes they tried to treat gay men with cross-sex hormones to cure them. It, it, Cross-sex hormones, nothing is going to change a male's sexual orientation. Now, females, so I have written a paper uh, that I, I would be delighted to share with whoever. The title of the paper is, What is Sexual Orientation and Do Women Have One? And based on a lot of research that I have done, I'm not sure what female sexual orientation even is. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me if some females, natal females, will claim that their uh, sexual orientation changed a lot, you know, depending on what hormonal regimen they're on. Uh, I don't I don't know. It would be um, interesting uh to uh study that uh you know one one could put them in a, a brain scanner and show them erotic stimuli we've done research like that uh but not with this population but i i guess this is one of those um times when i just have to say i don't know interesting question yeah and i and i think with all the exposure of all the exogenous hormones at, at such a high level that again would be and really important area to study. Um, so here's a question from a critic. In speaking with many people who question their gender identity, none of them, as well as their parents, see themselves as this, as this appearing suddenly. What controls do you have in the research? Seems very biased to only ask parents and particularly have an entire study around a publication that isn't recognized. So I'm 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 glad to uh, bring yeah. that question forth because I, I I do you know people say well that wasn't sudden just as their point so yeah so please please comment yeah. to our critic and thank you critic for for coming yeah more uh, critics so, please yeah okay so, so, so we, we we certainly uh, acknowledge in the paper that the sample is biased in that way. Uh, and we're providing the, the parents' uh, version of that. Uh, and uh, 
We also, I, I also agree that the, the, the youth is more likely to say that they've had some kind of longstanding issue, although some of them will say that they've had longstanding issues that suddenly made sense when they realized they were trans. Um, so we have this uh, critic and I, we have uh, different sources saying different things. We need more data. And the uh, study that uh, I'm launching with Ken Zucker and Lisa Littman, we are going to recruit both parents and gender dysphoric youth to tell us their version of what's going on. And we'll see, we'll see uh, what they say. Um, so, but, but also my last word to the critic, you know, um, back in the early nineties, uh, young women were saying that their fathers, uh, uh, raped them daily and and had that they had babies that their fathers murdered and buried uh based on recovered memories um and their parents said no that didn't happen and i believe their parents back then it's not that parents are always right but it's sometimes when you have divergence uh the you know one side is righter than the other yeah. Well, I, again, I think the call to do more research and again, why why we're, we feel this webinar and all the webinars we do are so important, but particularly this topic is really because we have to get in, in the space of, you know, talking about this and asking for more research, not, um, you know, calling people names because they want to study things. Um, so we're trying to cancel them. So, and also I would say, you know, there's a, I, I feel people don't have uh, a grasp on like the history of how psychiatric illness was treated in our country for, you know, 100, 150 years and the different things that were done in the name of, of uh, improving mental health. Again, it's a very complicated situation if you have a loved one, especially a child with issues, but, you know, the common um example of lobotomies, you know, they thought they were really helping people um, because that was the only yeah. thing they felt was available for people who were just, you know, very um, out of, you know, very minimal functionality. Um, and this was before, you know, all the phenothiazines and, and whatnot. So, okay. Um, Given the commonality of non-persistence and significant medical complications, removal of healthy tissue of children, should crimes against humanity be considered for surgeons and practitioners recommending affirmative care um, before due diligence is given to exploratory therapy? So kind of getting right, right to the to the issue of, you know, uh, body modification and, and, you know, these irreversible um, you know, treatments that, that our medical world here in the States are doing as well as in Europe, but we're here. So what, what do you think about that? You want to take that hot potato? Well, the, the language is pretty extreme there. Uh, but I, I would say that, uh, much more, uh, medical treatment, hormonal and surgery is being done than should be and much less carefully done than should be. I mean, the, uh, again, I'm not a clinician, but the, the uh, whistleblower from Washington University, uh, I forget her name, but uh, it was uh, shattering uh, what I uh, read and heard that she saw. And uh, Washington University, St. Louis is a, superb hospital uh so it's going on there uh you know <laughs> and what's going on elsewhere it's scary to contemplate 
Uh, I personally uh, would not mind uh, a moratorium uh, on uh, medical treatment for um, minors, at least until we have better evidence uh, and perhaps better uh, treatments. Uh, but I, I don't want to say that uh, transition should never happen uh, because, you know, I, I pe some people I know and respect uh, who've had transition think it was very important uh, to them, but they're adults. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's uh, Jamie Reed. Um, at, right. Yeah. So, yeah. And I will, again, give that um, opioid analogy that, yes, pain exists and there's people that need it. But um, what was going on is that um, the uh, scope was so widened and the exposure was so broad, it captured a lot of people who it was not appropriate for. And then um, the ignoring of the adverse effects and the hospital is the ER visits, the hospitalizations, and young people who were dying, um, and a lot of just not wanting to acknowledge those numbers is very, you know, similar um, to what I seen. And it was in major medical centers across the country not acknowledging the level of issues going on. So again, we want to be talking about this because um, people are being harmed. So. Uh, just scanning through here. Uh, um, I guess, you know, somewhat related, do you think what happened to close Tavistock can happen here in America? In other words, how do we return to sanity in, in America? <laughs> um, but yes, the Tavistock, you know, in, 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 in England, there were whistleblowers there. Um, Cara Bell, uh, who I uh, was fortunate to meet, and um, Sue Evans, but she had had blown the whistle, I think, what was it, maybe 10 years before, like the first time was like 10 years before they finally were able to get it in the court. So, but just curious on your on your thoughts on that, maybe any parallels and how it will unpack here. Well, so there are places uh, primarily in uh, red states where, you know, government is, taking action. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen in California. Uh, and, but one thing that I think maybe we could get everybody on board with is uh, the need for follow-up data. And it's just, uh, should be criminal <laughs> to do these extreme interventions with people and and uh not know how they're turning out and uh i i could imagine uh legislation linking um uh protection from liability to uh following up patients for you know 10 years or something like that you know, people, these, uh, these youth sign consent forms and, you know, that's in America, I guess that, that often protects the surgeon, but, you know, it, it would be good. I, it's just irresponsible to uh, help in these transitions and not see how they turn out. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the whole follow up and all that is it and, and what Jamie Reed had, had described is is just really such an out outlier from the way, you know, we don't do, you know, like, uh, you know, cardiac bypass and then, you know, say like, see you later, you know, we have, we don't care what, you know, what happens here, we don't try and find you if you don't show up. So I mean, this is, you know, um, to, to not collect the data or, or I think maybe if there is data that's not being released, you know, um, is, is not consistent with, you know, ethical, high quality medicine. Um, and again, that what I saw during the opioid crisis was kind of similar, which, which led to the opioid, there's sort of a pharmacy tracking system that 
it's great that they had it, but it took like five years of this problem and until they did it. And I think something similar needs to be done, um, especially for, for kids. So, um, yeah. Okay. Recent research in areas of endocrinology and neuroendocrinology show that estrogen is a slow poison for the male body, causes depression to cognitive decline, leading to Alzheimer's and schizophrenia. Knowing that, how can estrogen be prescribed? I mean, that's kind of, you know, medical prescription question, but just, you know, this exposure to uh, these high doses of, of the hormones, um, you know, are you going to be tracking, you know, prescriptions at all or, or looking at pharmacy data in any of your future we're, research? We're, we're cert- you know, we're, okay. I mean, we're certainly going to be asking about, uh, you know, medical interventions. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, and again, I'm not a, I don't, I'm not a clinician. I don't treat uh, these people. But I can imagine that sometimes trade-offs have to be made. And, uh, you know, if somebody is extremely unhappy uh, with, bef- without transition and they're an adult, <laughs> then, I, you know, I can imagine somebody making that, uh, yeah. let's say, unhealthy decision. We, we allow uh, people to do that. That's yeah. not, you know, not necessarily saying we should, uh, you know, pay for it by insurance or or whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it it depends. I don't have a strong opinion on that, but uh, yeah, yeah. But again, I think it's to the point of like track. Like we're not tracking prescriptions, dosages, duration of exposure. To then, you know, later we're gonna see you know, a lot of different things. And we, you know, regardless of all of this, the, the, these people are humans that need to be cared for and, and having the information about what's exactly they've been exposed to when and for how long can be, you know, but is, is really valuable information. So for us who are seeing them in the hospitals, we, we want to do the best, best by them. Um, so, okay. A uh, little more back in your wheelhouse. What strategies uh, can we use to encourage our various academic psychology organizations to adapt a more data-focused approach to trans issues? Most of the clinical, social, personality, and developmental psychology research organizations seem to be captured by ideologic commitments rather than pursuing an empirical approach. Love to hear if you have a solution because we need that on the on the medicine clinical side. <laughs> I, yeah. Welcome to my world. I, I mean, I spend a lot of my waking hours either reading or brooding or trying to connect with like-minded people in the academy uh, to try to, uh, you know, get back, get away from identity politics and get back to uh, science. Uh, so I, I think... It would be, so my ideal uh, would be to, for a university to acknowledge that there's this big controversy and universities are the best places to research and debate controversies (laughs) and uh, let's, you know, let's hold debates, let's and not, you know, cancel unpopular speakers so that they can't come on campus. Uh, Let's do good research rather than, you know, just uh, open a hospital uh, to transition uh, gender dysphoric uh, youth like my university has done. Um, So, you know, it's, it's unfortunate uh, at least in this respect, I, I really don't want to get into national politics, but just that uh, the Biden administration uh, seems to have their mind completely made up on uh, transgender issues, which is, you know, transition is transition, transition, transition. Uh, it would be great if uh, the federal government uh, made um 
uh, made it a priority to collect needed data uh, and to have the best scientists do it. And, and you know, th there's a, a lot of uh, disagreement probably among about who the best scientists are. And, uh, but there's even, you know, the possibility of having adversarial collaborations. People who disagree fundamentally with each other could get together and try to decide what kind of data would uh, help move the ball forward and so on. But we definitely and desperately need better data, particularly in about ROGD, but, but really about all of them. We just, we need different kinds of data, uh, but we, we need follow-up data in all. Awesome. And just like your uh, animal house analogy, we need like a, a good food fight, a good intellectual. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, but that yeah. we are we are close to the to the end. And I mean, God, it's flown by and we, we have 124 questions and we have, uh, you know, over 250 people on and I, I don't know, you know, Twitter, Facebook, everyone, but I. I just want to thank you so much again. I, again, we are huge supporters here, fair of just having the space to have these conversations that, you know, five minutes ago were like, uh, you know, we wanted to, we were all okay talking and um, we, we don't support canceling people who are uh, canceling anyone, but people who are trying to understand what's happening in science and especially with our our youth and, and, and mental health and all of this. So yeah, we need, we need to be talking more knowledge. Knowledge is good. Um, you're a bright light over there at Northwestern. We're, we're only a couple miles away, you and I. So, um, uh, but yeah, I, 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 I may have ridden by your house earlier. I, I think so. <laughs> so, um, but I just want to thank, you know, all my, all my, um, partners at, at FAIR, all the great people there doing a great job. Um, our new interim uh, director, Maude Marin, and then, I mean, Segum, the, these, these people involved are just amazing people. Uh, everyone just wants, wants the best for kids, and we need to just keep talking about what, the, what that is. So um, I don't know, you have one minute, if you want to say, say anything, anything else, please, please do. Um, I, I just want to say that, that your existence, you personally and the organization <laughs> and everybody here, it just, uh, it, it helps my heart. It means so much to me. Thank you. And, you know, if, if anybody has a burning question uh, and they email me, I'll try to get back to them if they can be patient. Awesome. We will make sure to, they have your contact info or we could drop, uh, I think our uh, tech people could put it in the chat. And then we do have so many questions. We we do try and get those answered. It takes us a little bit of time. Um, but again, we, we just are so, so grateful to everybody. And uh, with that, I will say good night. But, but I have, we have another webinar tomorrow on the legislative map on all the gender healthcare related uh, legislation that's passed. So if you want a different angle on it, um, please attend tomorrow. It's at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, and that link has been going around, but we'll shoot it out again tomorrow. So that is the final word. And I thank you all very much and have a great evening and see you soon.